everyone. Welcome to our event. My name is Anna Miranda and I'm Knowledge Exchange Associate for the Low and Middle Income Cities Research Group, ELMIC, which is based in the College of Social Sciences. ELMIC brings together international research projects related to sustainable development challenges in the Global South. One of our main goals is to promote dialogue and collaboration between researchers national governments and development partners. Before I introduce you to our chairperson, I would like to give you some brief housekeeping instructions. I want to let you know that the discussion will be recorded and we will send you a link to the video after the event. Please keep your microphones muted in order to reduce background noise. Although you will be muted, we would love to get questions from our audience. So please post your questions on the chat box or via Twitter using the hashtag housing cities. We will forward them to the chair. Okay, so that's all the housekeeping done. I am very pleased to introduce all of you to our chair, Robert Lewis Lettington, who is chief of the land, housing and shelter section at the UN Habitat. Robert has worked in several different countries and has over 20 years of experience providing technical assistance to policy formulation and program implementation in a number of areas, such as urban development, housing, land management, human rights, and digital governance. Thank you, Robert, for chairing our event today, and it's over to you. Thank you very much, Anna. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, we never know with these things when it's working and when it's not. Is that okay? Yeah, I see a smile, not a frown, so I'll take that as a good sign and go forward. Um, well, thank you, everybody. I mean, just briefly to, to, to say, firstly, thank you very much to, to Glasgow and to the partners involved for having this meeting. Um, it's always a great pleasure to, to be able to take part in these events. Uh, sadly, we often have to say no to more than we can say yes to, so I'm really glad to be able to, to join this one. Uh, we're in the midst of the Habitat Executive Board, so these issues are live before member states as, as we speak now. Um, and uh, we will be able to feed that back into discussions. Um, to turn more specifically to the subject of COVID and housing, um, obviously housing is central to Habitat's agenda. It was the basic reason Habitat, Habitat was established in the first place, to look at questions of housing and shelter more generally um, in a wide range of situations from emergencies to, to more systemic um, issues in, in peace, more peaceful countries. Um, and to look at the question of the right to adequate housing as a development question and as a social issue that impacts individuals. Um, I would note in that regard that, of course, the right to adequate housing has a number of different dimensions to it. The traditional human rights trio of respecting, protecting and fulfilling. So we need to respect the right and not detract from it. That is member states in particular should they should be looking to protect that right, i.e. to prevent anybody else taking that away. And they should be looking at within the scope of the resources available, how they go about fulfilling that. Um, these become particularly appropriate at the moment, I think, because the COVID pandemic has taken us back to many of the origins of town planning and of public health planning. Um, both in the ancient era and in the modern, the reason that we decided to take town planning seriously and public health seriously was because of pandemics of different kinds um, or other very similar public health threats. That, in a way, had kind of receded in the last decades, maybe the last 40, 50 years, that receded as the central issue, and we started to looking at other questions. Now it's coming back on the table and COVID is really making us revisit why we take planning seriously, why we take housing seriously. We are, as Habitat, we are very glad to see many of the emergency measures that states have taken. And in many cases, individual cities have taken as well. It's been an interesting governance exercise watching these emergency measures come in. The many, many of these have touched on the homeless, they've touched on low income housing, 
They've also, in some cases, touched on the quality of housing, and there is many, many discussions going on. There are many discussions going on about how we can improve the quality of housing supply over the long term. However, we do have major concerns about what a lot of the measures that have been put in place mean for the longer term. What will happen next? Um, where, will, where will we go? For example, if we have a situation where we have a moratorium on evictions, what happens when that moratorium is lifted? What happens to the processes? What happens to the people? So we really are in desperate need of longer term solutions and longer term thinking as we, we begin to get a grip on the immediate emergency situations. This kind of forum is a fundamental place to start these thoughts, to start taking these things forward and seeing where we can go. I am very aware that I'm not meant to be a presenter and I will cut my comments short for in favor of people who are far cleverer and uh, have far more sophisticated a set of proposals than I do on these things. Um, I will we'll go forward and uh, introduce each speaker one by one so that, that by the time we reach each one, we haven't sort of forgotten who they are and uh, where they come from. Um, our first speaker is Mauro Sanchez, an epidemiologist at the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation and an associate professor at the Department of Public Health at the Federal University of Brasilia, Brazil holds a master's degree from the Brazilian National School of Public Health and a PhD from Johns Hopkins in the US, has worked for the Ministry of Health in Brazil and also served as Associate Director for Science at the Center CDC in Maputo, Mozambique. So a wonderfully broad range of education and experience there to, to draw on and particularly uh, that ability to, to apply the public health lens to, to some challenging situations in low-income housing. Um, Mauro, I will, will uh, highlight to you, as I will to the other speakers as we go along, that we have 10 minutes, and uh, I have been asked to be fairly strict on that. So I will give you a nudge when we're coming close to time, and then I will try and shut it down as soon after that as I can. Apologies, um, I don't want to be harsh about that, but sometimes no option. But please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And thank you uh, for the organizers of this event, for the invitation. And I'm glad to see a large number of people here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, so I can start my presentation so I don't you know, uh, waste any time. Uh, I hope you can see my screen shortly. OK, I Hang hope up. that's fine, right? I can't see it yet, but it says it's coming. Yes, yeah, it there that's it. Oh, okay. So uh, what I was asked to do, um, and I'm gonna give you a brief uh, flavor of what Brazil is doing in terms of response to the, to the, to the pandemic, in terms of housing initiatives. Um, I'm gonna talk mainly about uh, one large uh, housing uh, program we have in Brazil in place, uh, for 11 years and how the country has been trying to respond to the challenges posed by the pandemic that we have uh, been experiencing since March. So as Robert was saying, I'm from the University of Brasilia and a researcher at CIDAX, uh, which is a center for integration of data and knowledge for health that belongs to the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil. It should be... Uh, My slide should be moving, but it's not moving. Just hold on a second, please. I don't know why my slide's not going forward. Yeah, that's what happens. It will always work perfectly in practice and be miserable on the day. <laughs> I can't seem to. Can you exit it and then uh, try to come back in? Sharing. I want to stop sharing and start again. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to try again here very briefly. OK.
Would you like me to try share your site for you, Mauro? Yes, please, because I, I don't know what's happening. I can't move from slide from the first slide to the second one. If you can share your screen, I'll 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 say next. I'm sorry. I tried to keep it errors. I tried the space bar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. So can you go to the next one, please. I lost three minutes. Okay. I'm gonna be brief. I'm gonna talk briefly about, as I said, the main housing program we have in country, which is called Minha Casa Minha Vida, which stands for, I mean, it translates to My House My Life program. And it's basically a program that consists of, you know, buying land uh, uh, by the government and building real estate. Uh, and that, and those houses or, 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 or apartments will be sold uh, to families with a very low income. And that's the range here that we are focusing on in Brazil. So up to 1,800 reais, which is equivalent to, you know, at the rates today uh, to around 240 uh, pounds. Um, uh, I want to highlight that this program has more than one range. We're focusing on the lowest range, which is the, the, the most vulnerable portion of the population. Next, please. And, and, and the objective of building this program was not just to address the housing deficit or, or address housing uh, inadequacy, but also to stimulate the economy because uh, civil construction in Brazil is one of the largest drivers of employment. And that was one of the main interests when the program was uh, conceptualized, thought about in 2009. So it's for giving housing to people in need, mobilizing formal market for, social, for housing production, and also stimulate economic growth, as I mentioned. But in addition to that, promote income distribution and social inclusion. Next. Just a brief uh, scenario of Brazil. Brazil has a huge housing deficit, which was estimated in over 5 million residences in Brazil. And most of these are in urban areas. Brazil is a very large country, as you know, is a continental country. And there's a lot of contrast in Brazil. Brazil is a country that's very heterogeneous in terms of uh, social economic uh, situation you know, uh, between groups. And, and it's in urban areas where this contrast is more evident. And the housing deficit, as I said, is mostly concentrated in urban areas. Inadequacy, very large extent to this. Over three million families living in slums, and this this demand for for housing will only increase until uh, the next decade. Next, this program has covered almost all of the country. So almost all of the municipalities in Brazil, 96%, have been um, um, uh, attended by the program. Uh, Brazil has over 5,000 municipalities. The program has benefited 15 million people so far, with priority being given to, to families with people with disability and family with elderly members. The focus um, when people apply for this program is uh, on women uh, as, head, as head of households because of the vulnerability that comes along with, uh, with losing the male as the, as the, head, of household, as the head of household as, as it happens in, in many countries. Next. Okay, and just these three pictures, it's just so you can see how it looks like. Uh, the program has three phases, um, which you know, started in 2009. So it started as a you know, one story, uh, buildings for, for this uh, population, next. Then in the next three years, you know, they moved to two stories building, again, improving the, the housing quality, the, 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 the environmental situation, uh, areas for leisure, uh, green areas, green coverage of soil, and the next. And that's the current um, format of the program, uh, which, uh, which also increases the, the number of uh, housing units available for this, uh, this vulnerable portion of our population. Next. So in the end of my talk, I'm gonna specifically talk about what's been done in Brazil to address this issue. Uh, we, can't, we can't come up with a new program during the pandemic. No, the, the period is very short. Robert briefly talked about evictions. We're trying to do what the country is trying to do is considering that, as I said before, this program is focusing on tier one because there are more than one, one tier of income. It's focusing on people who earn this level of income here that's on their screen. And that these families are the ones that can uh, suffer the most uh, with the pandemic. So um, it, is, it is proven that 
these people are being hit the hardest. Uh, and the gap between the rich and the poor, you know, is widening a little bit with the pandemic. Next. So what can be done, what, what, what has been done, the government uh, with the help of, you know, the academia, um, uh, key stakeholders is trying to push for legislation to try to prevent people from losing the houses they, they, they received within the scope of this program. So there were some decrees that were tried um, uh, to, to, to be put in effect, but then uh, they hit a legal hurdle, which was they need to make a law uh, out of that to make that uh, effective. Next. So there's some, some bills that were sent to Congress uh, and some bills um, are partly you know, moving along as we expect. The National Housing Secretariat um, that belongs to the Ministry of, of Regional Development, which is the one in charge of this housing program, uh, made it public that they're very much in favor of these bills. So they try to, to advocate in favor of these, but uh, the main one right now, which suspends payments from people in this tier one of My House, My Life program right now uh, went through the chamber and is pending a vote in the Senate. So we still have to wait to see if that's gonna become a reality. Next. In addition to keeping people from this large program in their houses, uh, not being sent you know, elsewhere because of lack of payment, uh, Brazil has also tried to pass legislation to prevent eviction. So landlords would not be able to evict someone for lack of payment. But you see that there's lots uh, of issues involved, lots of political interests, economic interests. So this, this specific law uh, was vetoed in Congress. So we don't think that that's gonna happen anytime soon. Next. And lastly, um, there was one initiative that's not directly related to housing, but indirectly uh, gives a very good perspective for people to stay where they are and not lose their homes. Uh, there was an emergency income initiative from the federal government, uh, which has been giving 600 reais, around 80 pounds uh, between April and August, and then the half of that for the rest of the year. Um, looks like not that much money, but overall it's a, it's a budget of 43 billion pounds in this year. And we are confident that there's a benefit for these people that I'm talking about, this vulnerable population that needs social housing because the database used to allocate these resources is the same database um, that registered people re who received this uh, My House, My Life program. So we don't have the numbers, we don't have the actual data, but we assume that there's a large overlap, overlap between people who received this emergency income and people who received our benefit, the housing benefit. Next, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, so uh, in summary, Brazil has one of the largest social housing programs in the world, as you, as you could see by the numbers that I showed you. Uh, and right now the attempt is to keep the gains, not lose what they have you know, obtained in the past few years. And as a conclusion of what, what we have observed so far during the pandemic, uh, I, can, I can confidently say that broader uh, social and economic measures can and would affect uh, housing quality in Brazil and affordability of housing may be diminished in inadequacy, uh, both for the immediate future and for the long run. Next. Yeah, that's what I had to say. I thank you for your attention. And here's my contact if you, uh, if you wanna get in touch and I'm open to questions when the discussion time comes. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you're doing brilliantly on time, despite technology doing its best to trip you up. Um, that always might make such chair's life much, much easier. I think also a number of the issues that you hit on are very important across the board. I mean, Brazil may have a very particular experience in this situation, but the, you know, ensuring the central issue of people with disabilities, of women headed households in this situation really struck out to me. And then also the way in which you, you're looking at the interplay between direct cash benefits and in-kind supports that keep things going. That it isn't just one solution that often you've got to have a couple of things interacting with each other to look at how, how you get a good outcome. Um, without further ado, I shall move on to our next speaker, Dr. Josephine Malonza. Um, I, I love the, the introduction of her bureaucracy, which starts with an enthusiastic and curious architect and urban designer. I think these are things that these are passions that we always have to keep alive in life. 
Um, she is keen on the dialectical relations between architecture and society, particularly passionate about the quality of life in urban areas. My first master's degree was in architectural history, so I have total sympathy for that. Um, she holds a PhD in architecture, so actually knows how to build things, whereas I can just draw pictures of them, uh, from the University of Nairobi in Kenya. Um, is the founding dean of the School of Architecture and the Built Environment in the University of Rwanda, where she has been substantially involved in teaching, research and community engagement for the last 10 years. Um, her work being inspired by the concept of cultivating learning environments that are participatory, reflective, action focused and change oriented, which is just what we need more of. She's been involved in international research with the Center for Sustainable, Healthy and Learning Cities, UN Habitat, the Global Green Growth Initiative. She has also served as vice chair of the technical advisory group supporting the city of Kigali in the revision of the Kigali City Master Plan. Not an easy job and sits in various boards for joint sector review in the Ministry of Infrastructure in Rwanda. And she is finally also a column writer for Rwanda's leading English daily, The New Times, um, which also gives an outlet that I wish often I had, but of course, as a functionary, I have no opinion on anything. Um, but please, over to you, Dr. Malanza. Thank you. I have picture, but no sound. We can't hear you if you'd like to unmute your microphone. I'm being told the host muted me. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. On you go. Yeah. Uh, okay. And you can see my screen? Yes. Oh, sorry. It seems like all of us are not very lucky with technology, but let's hope. Yeah, that, don't uh, work doesn't... fine. Please go ahead. Let's hope it doesn't get worse than that. Yes. So my presentation today is uh, trying to paint a picture on housing for all. Uh, and this is both during the COVID-19 and beyond and the experience from Rwanda. Uh, so on my first slide, um, COVID-19 has been a rude interruption to all of us and housing has not been, you know, an exception. Uh, in this photo here, uh, this a bit paints a picture of Rwanda, which is the land of a thousand hills. So for us here, before COVID, uh, there was already existing, uh, you know, constraints and opportunities from the topography and, you know, from all this rapid urbanization, informal urbanization that we are having to deal with. So COVID just comes into, you know, as a stronger force to you know, help us reflect better on how we can coexist, how we can live together in one city, in our cities. A zoom in into this housing uh, situation here, a bit paints a clearer picture of the informality that, that I've just been talking about. The little boy in the middle of the picture has not been placed there by Photoshop, neither is he walking on someone's roof. He is actually commuting to or from school. And this is in search for education and his future prosperity. And this, you know, this juncture is where, you know, the reflection starts to happen, you know, in terms of how, how, how do we coexist and how can we coexist better? And this is infrastructure, housing, and the people. So in this slide here, I'm, I'm putting a reflection on sustainable development, you know, having for long been a very top-down, you know, process. And, you know, for how long these top-down uh, policies and practice you know, can keep going? And, you know, what are the changes that, that we need to start seeing to be a bit more proactive, you know, and pragmatic? The crisis itself is reminding us that, you know, there can be bottom-up or grassroots interventions that can be plowed into the, you know, top-down policies and practices, you know, to create a, a better appreciation of realities on the ground and, and, and towards, you know, a future of uh, sustainable, inclusive cities. So this in itself requires systemic, uh, systemic thinking. And this is what is being called a transdisciplinarity in, in the current research context. So this is where SHLC comes in. This is the Center for Housing, uh, Cent Center for Sustainable, Healthy and Learning Cities. How could I forget what this is about? And this is a project funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund. And we've been studying 14 cities over the last three years and, and maybe an extra one year. 
And the focus here was to strengthen research capacity, understanding and addressing urban health and education challenges in, in neighborhoods. So it, it does a cascading uh, scaling from the city to the neighborhood and to the household scales. So on this reflection, uh, two uh, perspectives come in place and one is the policy and the other one is practice. So looking at the policy perspective, in Rwanda, we are not less of policy, uh, planning policy or housing policy. And the issue of social protection has been you know, in place. And I would say broadly so since the post genocide government. And this is a country that needed you know, lots of interventions in how do we reduce poverty, how do we grow the economies? Issues to do with social cohesion, peace and reconciliation. So there were a lot of building blocks you know, that necessit necessitated the thinking around social protection. And currently, uh, all these policies towards uh, poverty reduction, economic development, have now moved into what we call the National Strategy for Transformation, NST, that is built on three pillars, economic transformation, social transformation, and transformation of governance. So looking at you know, the indicators for these pillars, the question remains, you know, how do we? Yes, uh, the policy is there, but how do we actually you know, make the steps to the tomorrow that uh, has been planned? So specifically on housing, um, social protection is, is, ex is exhibiting both you know, physical and, and the social dimensions. On the physical dimension, we do have you know, instances where different groups of people have actually you know, stepped up to build shelter or do public work for vulnerable communities. But on the social dimension, which is uh, perhaps more interesting in the context of the conversation today, is that we do have all this you know, financial support through cash transfers or transfers in kind, where communities have been encouraged you know, through elements like just a cow. How does a cow move from one family to another? And this, um, you know, transfer in kind, you know, goes further to build the social, the economic, and the ecological you know, frameworks and networks for these people. But uh, back to the other perspective that I call practice is you know, using a picture, a very beautiful picture of Kigali city here is a reflection on the different narratives or the different layers that one can extract you know, from an image like this. So for me, in what I call juxta spaces, uh, this is uh, the image on the top is you know, clearly an image that most of us you know, I've come across uh, when you Google Kigali city. And this is the real city, you know, the real clean, safe city, you know, and all the, you know, labels that go with this. But the picture at the bottom is also the reality, you know, of the other part of Kigali city. And this is the arrival city. You know, the area where most of the informal settlers, the low income people reside. And, and this has, you know, a particular historical uh, circumstance, but at the same time, it also has the enthusiasm of low income you know, uh, residents wanting to be closer to the city, wanting to be part you know, of the efforts to build the city and you know, wanting to live near work. But so the question here is in the face of you know, a pandemic like COVID-19, right? How can we coexist or you know, how can we coexist better? One of the efforts uh, here in Kigali uh, that, that, that has come into in an attempt to strike the balance for adequate housing has been through a project like this. Uh, this project is seeking to promote residents to a newer life or a modern life by putting them in new housing, modern blocks, but it happens to be, you know, more than 20 kilometers away from, you know, their current base, which is within the city. So the unseen consequences here uh, is likely to introduce fragilities. And as you and I can be questioning right now, is how will they, how, how do these uh, residents cope with the new distances to work? you know, once they've been moved to the very urban areas. Um, through the SHLZ project, one of the findings that were clear was that informal settlement households actually prefer to live, you know, near where they work. And from our research, over 70% of these households lived two kilometers from the work. So definitely, uh, you know, this kind of uh, relocating people from the city to an area far away, will have an impact and one would ask, you know, a question as to whether this does not physically and financially segregate the people, you know, from the city life. On the other hand, uh, is a project like this that seeks to strike the same balance again in adequate housing. And this project uh, is more of in, in, in situ uh, upgrading. So taking the same informality that you've seen in the picture before, 
but you know, building these, keeping the communities where they are, formalizing the informal. Uh, and if there are consequences to such a project, I, I would not personally see a direct connection, you know, to the COVID-19 crisis. But, you know, the fact that the social fabric of the people is kept, the residents remain intact, uh, they do not have to worry about new distances to work or, you know, new uh, jobs, uh, work of, uh, loss of, of work, or, you know, loss of that connection to the city. So overall, the social, the economic and the ecological relations to the city remain maintained. And this is what brings us to this reflection here. This is uh, the two images next to each other is the Kigali Master Plan of 2013 and the revised Master Plan that was launched a few minutes, uh, a few months ago. Yes, it sounds like a few minutes ago. And from this picture, it's clear that, you know, the rescaling has been there and the rethinking has been there. And the image on the right, uh, I would say, you know, is a very good representation of an inclusive city where everyone is welcome and everyone is invited. A specific to housing is this graphic here that clearly uh, gives us the difference between rigid planning and flexible planning. And, and so, you know, the, this idea of incremental housing and starting small and putting, you know, blocks together. Uh, so this is the last slide. And, and, and to me, uh, it's a conclusion of where the focus needs to be right now. Yeah, that housing can and should be participatory and people driven. You know, looking at you know the, the, the two project uh, examples that I've just given, uh, and looking at the fact that COVID nineteen itself as 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 you know brought in a catalyst. It's been a catalyst on the importance of community in housing and in urban planning. Community became the new keyword, you know, in, in everyday operations around public health. At the same time, community can also be you know a keyword for planning and for housing. And so moving forward towards a human centered design, embracing holistic thinking, you know, the questions of the who and the why, you know, we have to take the decisions that we take is more important now than ever. And, and what comes to mind, which is a bit more thought provoking here is, can we even go ahead and change the language of housing and planning? You know, this issue of master plans has been, you know, going through my head and I've just been questioning myself, isn't there a better language that we can use? Because clearly there is no master in, in housing or in planning. Yeah, can this shift to collaborative design? You know, would, would that be more pro, 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 pragmatic? I don't know. This is a question that maybe we could take, take on on the discussions. So uh, uh, my last uh, sentence or, or paragraph is this would be that, you know, looking at the planning and, and the housing for tomorrow post COVID, the lessons that we are picking, you know, from what's happening in, in, in our cities uh, today can orient, you know, ourselves towards socially and sustainable, uh, inclusive urbanization and cities. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much again for being very good on time and uh, making me avoid looking like a bully from the chair. Um, I think some excellent points there, certainly as a, as a UN staffer, they're linking of social protection with peace and security as an issue, I think is extremely important, not just for post-conflict societies. I think it's one that no society can afford to take completely for granted, that if our social protections break down, we do, we do face increased threats on security and even sometimes to peace. Well, then also that emphasis of the human experience around housing and planning, whether it's that question of transition spaces in cities or connectivity or, or the sense of place, these are all critical issues. I think this also, uh, that social dimension pulls us to very neatly to our third speaker, uh, Dr. Smarajit Jana, um, an epidemiologist and public health specialist who is a member of the National Task Force on COVID-19 in India. Uh, his work has historically focused on sexual health and HIV prevention. And Dr. Jana has developed a successful HIV prevention program targeting sex workers, which has been adopted by several international institutions and donor agencies. Dr. Jana is currently acting as the director of the, forgive my pronunciations here, the Sonagachi Research and Training Institute in Kolkata and chief, is chief advisor to the Durbar Mahila Samanwaya Committee, a collective of sex workers in West Bengal. I think this is a, a perfect uh, rounding off to our discussions, following the principle that any society that protects its most vulnerable and those facing the greatest challenges will protect everybody. So over to you, Dr. Jana. 
Uh, good evening and welcome to you all. Uh, may I request Anna to project my slides? Yeah. So I think, can you move to the second slide, please? Already I have been introduced. Yes. I think I start with this importance of housing in the backdrop of COVID-19 epidemic. It doesn't require much explanation that um, in disease transmission dynamics, there is a uh, particularly with uh, special focus to respiratory tract related infection, housing has a lot of bearing. Uh, and COVID-19, as we know, spread through droplets and India having a huge populations, roughly 1.4 billion. Presently, we stand second next to USA in term of reported cases of COVID-19. And I think today's uh, figure is about uh, 8 million who are, uh, who are COVID-19 positive. However, death is around uh, 119,000 if you take the today's figure. Next slide, please. Uh, but uh, before going into this housing, what is the state of housing in India? Uh, as per our census, which is uh, nine years old, but um, uh, we can see that major Indian cities are overcrowded with poor housing and lack of hygienic environment. In fact, 43 to 47 percent of people live in slums in all major metropolis like Calcutta, Delhi, Mumbai or Chennai and roughly 20% are homeless in these cities and the most important part in connection to COVID-19 is that our population density is extremely high. It ranges between 60 to 70 thousands per square mile. The picture actually shows how, how it is crowded in streets or in housing uh, families who are fortunate in having some sort of housing facilities do not, uh, housing facilities do not enjoy adequate living and dining spaces. In fact, for an average family size of four or more, uh, around 50% of those families live in a single room. That is as per our census. Next slide, please. So, uh, uh, when you actually confronted with COVID-19, as we know, the known means of prevention includes safe distancing, home quarantine, and frequent washing of hands, among others. So how these three basic preventive measures is uh, workable in a country like ours is a questionable issue. Uh, as per report, as we know, 78 to 85% of cases took place within household settings as, as observed in China and about 70% in Korea. So it is extremely important how we can prevent in-house transmissions when someone is infected with COVID-19, uh, the home quarantine facilities, uh, how far we will be able to provide. That's, that's a major challenge and how far we could actually uh, uh, advise people to go for uh, house quarantine. Instead, we essentially has to pitch for institutional quarantine and some states uh, in, in big cities, I think the state government and national government, of course, took a, I, I think a very strong initiative to come up with this sort of institutional quarantine facilities for the infected or possibly infected individual. Next slide, please. So spaces uh, is a, are a privilege in most of the cities. I think this is a picture of Dharavi, one of the largest slum in Asia. Uh, I think situated in Mumbai, uh, this photograph speaks uh, itself the living conditions. Even during the month of Shamar, uh, inhabitants of the slum compete with each other to collect a bucket full of drinking water. So when you are talking about frequent washing of hands with soaps or detergent, uh, soaps and sanitizer, uh, it's, it's very difficult to observe. 
and in this room in the slum situations five to six people managed to live through sharing a space of eight to ten square feet so self distancing uh, i think uh, is is a, is a, a nightmare for them next slide please and now come to some of the important element when you talk about how far uh, we are successful in providing uh, sort of good housing or quality housing uh, it is better to see from the lowest uh, rank of the people like uh, those who uh, live in a, uh, or share these rooms in entertainment industry it is one such picture this is called sonagachi the largest uh, red light district in city calcutta and more than 5000 sex workers live and operate from this place physical distance is is unthinkable and sex services which they deliver requires intimacy and socialization are uh, there the living come working rooms are often separated with curtains to ensure privacy while they are engaged with their clients So these are known facts, but how they fare with this situation or under the impact of COVID uh, is an important issue to be shared with. Next slide, please. Yeah, housing for all. Where we are basically, I think as uh, the previous speakers shared their experience in their countries uh, coming back to India. Uh, so how far we have progressed in this direction? That is. housing for all is there any policy changes to address covid 19 in the recent past third question whether demand for housing has translated into an political agenda unfortunately answer to all these questions are emphatically no that means none of these issues has been uh, uh, has come into the focus even Uh, in, in, in the in the situation of covid 19 pandemic next slide please well we have certain uh, housing uh, policies and programs which are are uh, in uh, place uh, like we call pradhan mantri awas yojana that means prime minister housing plan for urban poor for gramin poor also and there is some plan for interest subsidy to middle income groups then rehabilitation for slum dwellers there is a plan where if land is given free of cost by the state government then housing could be constructed and then promotion of housing for weaker sections uh, for which uh, national government provide credit linked subsidy which ranges between 100000 uh, uh, indian rupees to 100 uh, to uh, 1200 indian rupees next slide please but all these things uh, which are ongoing program has uh, made little change in the life and working conditions particularly in cities so whether national policy on housing to address covid 19 has Uh, is there any sort of new policy no there is no such thing uh, no rental subsidy for poorer section of the society in urban settings no such policy exists at this juncture no special provision for lgbtq and sex workers no policy for temporary protection for the poorer section with special focus to migrant workers there is no moratorium on evictions at least not at the policy level contrary to advisories of the un i think there were 45 incidents of recorded eviction during april may uh, which is potentially a death sentence to those families and there is no emergency rental assistance neither in the policy not in the program next slide please i think uh, particularly this covid has impacted hard uh, uh, particularly affecting the informal sectors as per the ilo there are 41 crores of informal workers in india which is equivalent to one third of indian populations 
and around 20% of them falls in the category of interstate migrant workers. Their plight due to COVID-19 related stigma was enormous. Even though a percentage of them do have their houses in their villages, they were deferred from returning home for more than two months. Many of them, even after coming home, were not allowed to stay in their houses. That to leave uh, outside houses uh, for fear of stigma and discrimination. Next slide, please. However, uh, there are some ray of hopes. Even the picture which I have shared with you. Start wrapping up, please. Yeah, I am just wrapping up. So this is the last slides. Uh, this is uh, the ray of hope is brought by even by the sex workers. Uh, I think this organization of sex workers, which represent voices of 60,000 sex workers, negotiated successfully with the landlords to waive rents, which, which are paid by the sex workers. They organized food packets to their colleagues regularly, feeding no less than 50,000 sex workers since April till that. And DMSC moved to the Supreme Court of India, the highest court, and judges of the court handed over a strong verdict to ensure regularization and transfer of cash to all sex workers in the country, which indirectly helps preventing transmission of COVID among the sex workers, which is very, very low even today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry to have to chase up there. Um, a lot of very stimulating points. I mean, the this central issue of importance to us of uh, the question of overcrowding versus concepts of density these are not the same thing. Density does not necessarily create a problem, whereas overcrowding does. Um, I think also the, the issue of remembering that home can be a workspace and the question of correlation of the nature of work and exposure to, to threats from the pandemic. And then finally, I'm always intrigued by, by this point about um, very rightly made about the risk of eviction as a death sentence, but also the, the failure of the recognize that you evict people and you put them into movement. You are not only threatening them, you are threatening your society as a whole, because that will promote circulation of the of COVID. And that threatens all parts of society, not just the people you're evicting. So keeping people safe and secure benefits all of us. Um, amazing how that keeps coming back. Um, we have now invited um, a small panel to respond to the presentations and to the issues at large. First off, I will invite uh, Rajiv Ranjan Mishra, who is a mechanical engineer and senior civil servant from the government of India. In his last assi assignment as additional secretary in the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, he was responsible for the formulation of various housing policies and legislation, including the implementation of the new urban agenda. Rajiv is currently acting as the Director General of the National Mission for Clean Ganga Ministry of Jal Shakti of the Government of India. Over to you, Rajiv. Have we got you there? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you yeah. very well. Now. Thank okay. you. First of all, let me thank for inviting me and it has been really very nice listening to the three panelists uh, uh, giving different perspectives uh, of the problem. Uh, I fully agree that a mass housing program or social housing program in a country like Brazil or India is, is a very massive exercise. And uh, uh, to share with you, COVID brought lots of unforeseen circumstances for the decision makers, for governments and for the community also. In India, we have also got a very major housing for all program, which uh, Mr. Dr. Jena also mentioned some of them. Uh, primarily what is happening in this uh, for the first time for the urban poor, slum and non-slum urban poor, a kind of mix of flexible program was brought. This program was going on and while this program, I, I, just to give you some number, I fully agree the issue of congestion was uh, the major issue because around 18 million was the estimated shortage of housing in India, 18 million, out of which almost 70% is on account of congestion. So that, that is one. Uh, 
uh, we when we started this program, a demand survey was made, and then the number actually after verification came to something like twelve to thirteen million. And so far, something like more than ten million houses have been sanctioned. Three and a half million houses have been completed. Roughly three million houses are under construction, and rest are different process. I mean, this is a kind of background of a major housing program which is going on. And right from 2017-18 onwards, there has been discussion on rental housing policy, and ministry also had contributed to understand the migrant problem. However, that policy was going on under discussion, but the issue of COVID-19 really brought this issue of the problem of the migrant worker to the notice of everyone. And I agree, there was a lot of misery, there was a lot of human concern. And perhaps a decision on rental housing. I think I would like to just inform Dr. Jena also that affordable rental housing complex has been, as a scheme, has been sanctioned because of the COVID emergency. So government actually took a view, and then the rental housing complexes are being created, and some of the vacant houses, because in public, many public houses which have remained vacant, unoccupied, they have been actually one model is to convert them into the rental housing complex. Of course, it takes time. In the short run, some other things also took place, like several states came up with some program, some, some places he has shown, some legal interventions also came, and policies happened. It was a very peculiar case of reverse migration, because people were leaving the cities, and it was also very hazardous, but they were going to the villages. And then transportation issues were there. For their sustenance and for their employment, the rural development uh, side, we have a scheme of employment scheme, almost 6 billion extra budget was given to that scheme. So I think several things happen. I'm not saying that they were immediately done or they, they could take away all the misery, but, but various things happen. And to take it that what happens after COVID. And another issue, I think um, uh, from Rwanda experience, few things I would like to just mention, people driven, people driven housing is better. That, that's very right. Because under this uh, housing for all scheme, urban scheme in India, several options are there. Like one option is beneficiary led housing, where the people have some part of land and then they construct, they, they actually go out of the congestion and 60% of the choice of the people or the 60% of the houses of this 10 million I'm saying has gone for this particular thing. So I think that that's a very good thing. Uh, density and congestion need not be same. I mean, you can plan. I think that, that was also a very nice uh, point. And then we are trying to do, uh, the ministry is trying to do that also in the urban planning, that you try to look for um, um, uh, more flexible master planning or planning exercise. That's, that's again something very important, which uh, I would like to share. Uh, the database, like in the case of Brazil, for my home, my life, the database, the similar database for housing or, for all, was very useful for finalizing some of the migrant workers or the rental housing complex workers also. So that database can be used. As I told you, we were anyway looking at the policy and due to this urgency, this crisis, some of these quick decisions have come. So I think uh, the, the, the concerned ministry will carry it forward. And then a kind of, I mean, after COVID for the long term, these things will become a kind of um, experience. And another very important thing is we also realize the importance of availability of water. I mean, it was mentioned uh, like for a bucket of water people have. So urban planning should actually look at availability of water and actually making it available to the vulnerable society. That, that's also a lesson which actually came very, very prominent uh, during this crisis. At present, I am in the water sector working. So actually we have taken up for the urban water sector management planning and those things have come. They, they will, it, it cannot change all of a sudden, but I think uh, in the long run, the importance of city and water, city and river has been focused because unless you have water and clean and good water, lots of sanitary problem, lots of health issues will also come. So I think I see some of the ongoing programs got little changed. The, the, the react, some reaction came from government and some new programs have come. And I think this will be the kind of um, direction in the future to carry forward. Several state governments have also started realizing the issue of migrant and you, you, you wrap up now. Yes. So Thanks. yeah, so I, I'm just closing. So these are some of my uh, thoughts uh, on these presentations and also the kind of direction in which Indian housing sector or housing for all in India is going on. Thank you. Thank you very much for those insights. Um, I would let, next like to invite Professor Vital Katikiredi um, an NRS Senior Clinical Research Fellow and an Honorary Consultant in Public Health at NHS Health Scotland. Vital currently acts as Deputy Director of the NIHR Global Health Research Group 
on social policy and health inequalities in the University of Glasgow. He has also served as a member of the Health of the Public in 2040 Working Group for the Academy of Medical Sciences. His chief research interests are in improving the development and application of evidence to inform public health policy. Vital studied at the University of Edinburgh, qualifying in medical sciences, genetics, and in medicine. Um, he had carried out his public health training at NHS Lothian. Please, over to you, Vital. Um, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, so I, I think we've had uh, some really fascinating presentations today. And speaking as someone who, uh, uh, so I wouldn't really consider myself to be an expert in housing, but more coming at this from the, from the health side of things. It, it's been really um, striking just how fundamental housing is to health. And I think that's come across uh, really well. But in particular, it's fundamental to discussions about health inequalities. So this is the, the persistent finding that, uh, that we see uh, throughout countries across the world that generally uh, more socially disadvantaged populations have considerably worse health. And that's in no small part uh, due to poorer housing as a, an important contributor. Um, in relation to COVID-19, I think um, it's reminded us, I suppose, of uh, the, uh, the, the origins of public health in uh, tackling infectious diseases and the role of housing and improving um, uh, the, the uh, urban planning and so forth uh, within that. Um, however, it's important to remember that actually uh, we know that um, housing isn't only important for, for COVID-19, it's also uh, crucial for a whole range of other disease, other infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis and so forth, but also um, the, the far larger uh, health burden of non-communicable diseases. So how we design our cities um, in terms of whether they uh, help facilitate, for example, active travel, so being able to uh, get to work within uh, the two kilometer uh, distance we heard about within Rwanda, for example, um, that's likely to, to also help people to stay physically active and um, having access to clean water and uh, appropriate cooking facilities and so forth is, is likely to help with uh, having a safe diet and a healthy diet. Um, I think uh, the it's 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 also been striking how the COVID pandemic um, has uh, flagged up uh, not just um, uh, the importance of the specific pandemic, but also uh, the likely upcoming uh, more substantive crises potentially even in public health terms. So, uh, in many countries, the costs of dealing with the pandemic. Uh, are likely to trigger an economic crisis and how we then address that in terms of uh, holding on to the gains that have been made in housing and major housing programs is going to be a real challenge and I'd be curious to hear about how, how countries can manage to do that. Um, and secondly, um, uh, the, the overarching problem of uh, the climate emergency so uh, that's probably, uh, whether it's actually contributed to the emergence of uh, the, the SARS virus this time round, it's likely to uh, certainly contribute to future pandemics and um, making sure we address the, 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 the longer term issue of the climate emergency in our response, uh, including in terms of our major social housing programs, uh, is going to be really crucial and making sure that um, new housing programs are uh, adapted to meet the needs of a changing environment, um, as well as reducing greenhouse uh, gas emissions is, is going to be crucial. Uh, so that's, those are my kind of initial thoughts. Excellent. 
Thank you very much. And you even came in ahead of time. That makes you top of my favourite list for the afternoon. Um, last and very definitely, without le not least, Professor Ken Gibb. Um, Professor Ken Gibb is the director of the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence and a professor in housing economics at the University of Glasgow. And from 2014 to 17 was co-director and the governance lead at the wonderfully named What Works Scotland. Ken's research interests are focused on the economic, financial and policy dimensions of housing. His current interests are on the financing and economics of social and affordable housing and the application of behavioral economics to housing. This is somebody I definitely need to talk to more. Ken has carried out research for government departments, ESRC, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, trade bodies, the private sector, and international organizations like OECD. We will do our best to add Habitat to that list before too long. Over to you, Professor Gibb. Thanks very much, Chair, and, and I'd like to start by thanking all the speakers today. It's been a really interesting afternoon. I, uh, I'm going to talk from a kind of northern uh, OECD kind of context, and I, of course, appreciate that the context is massively different to the very interesting stories we've heard from the likes of India, Brazil and Rwanda today. But I think there are some messages from the experiences in countries like the UK and Australia uh, and parts of Europe like Spain and Italy and of course America, which, which resonate and have some universal things that we can all think about. And to start with, uh, when the pandemic broke and countries went into a lockdown, there were some quite remarkable policy responses. So in a country like Britain, we managed to effectively end rough sleeping completely in a matter of weeks. Uh, some other policies like the suspension of evictions for rent arrears, uh, more progressive views about foreclosure and mortgage holidays and things of that kind, as well as the job support and furloughing type policies that were seen across uh, part, uh, the UK and, and the United States and elsewhere. Those things were, in a sense, an example where it's actually possible to deliver really radical policies quickly and do them quite effectively. I'm not saying they've done wholly effectively, but done quite effectively. And that's really not often the experience in countries like uh, Britain to take on such major challenges. However, secondly, uh, we, we introduced policies to try to stabilize the housing market in a view that we're going to move into a recession and, and something had to be done, but these were temporary measures. And it's actually turned out in Britain that they probably weren't necessary because the market rebounded quite strongly. Again, only on, a, on, only on a temporary basis. But really the point I want to make, the point I really want to stress today is that what the pandemic has done is it shed a rather uh, unflattering light on our housing system. Uh, it has demonstrated that uh, in a large significant sense, our housing isn't really fit for purpose. And what I mean by that is that, you know, housing in the country of the UK is dominated by the existing housing stock. We, we not surprisingly, focus a lot on new supply, but actually it's the existing housing stock that really matters and will continue to matter because we don't build, near, we don't replace nearly enough housing to make a difference. So our existing housing stock we now know is essentially too small for many people. It's got problems with space. It's got problems with lack of green space. It's got poor connectivity. And uh, frankly, the market is responding to that. There's already evidence in Britain and America, in Canada and Australia that in urban areas, uh, people are responding to the worries about high density and this lack of space and they're moving to suburbs and we can see price measures, we can see transactions evidence, we can see a state agency evidence of that going, going on. So the market is, is responding and as people are responding to being unsatisfied with their housing, about being worried about future lockdowns, about future pandemics and climate pressures, etc. And, and really that's a that's, that's a worry because I don't think government policy is, is at all there yet to, 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 to be considering these things. So there are, there are really important issues. And just finally to return to the existing housing stock issue and, and following up what the previous speaker said, I think there's a, there's a real opportunity here to, to make a virtue out of some of the problems that have emerged to, to think about this diagnosis that's emerging from, from uh, the pandemic which is to recognize that we need to make changes in the existing housing stock. And this is an opportunity to think about retrofitting and climate change on that sort of a sense. And that's also in a world of rapidly increasing unemployment, 
certainly in Britain, a lot of people are now thinking about really coherent large scale measures to have retrofit programs for air source heat pumps and things of that kind, which could be done on a really large scale, could train and skill thousands of people in a sec effectively a new green job se sector. And, and public policy think tanks like the IPPR in Britain have put a lot of research into this already and there's, there's a growing momentum and interest in it. Government departments in England are supporting this as a, as a way forward. So I think that we're now recognising that our existing housing stock is both not fit for purpose for people living in the threat of, of lockdown, that they're going to be more working at home. So it needs to be different, that we might need to rethink from a planning point of view, the importance of sub -sub suburbs. And we also should be thinking about the retrofit opportunity, which is clearly there as well. So I hope that doesn't stray too far off the off the uh, the, the criteria for the, the programme today, but that's the kind of points I wanted to make. So thanks for it very much. I, I don't think it's possible to stray off turf in this kind of subject area. Interdisciplinarity is, is pretty much key these days. I think also uh, what one thing I can't help thinking of here is starting off thinking about this interaction of housing, town planning, public health in my opening comments, and then your comment about speaking from a Scottish perspective. But I'm taken back to kind of schoolboy fascinations of, you know, this is exactly what Patrick Geddes was doing 100 years ago. He was working in Scotland. He was translating what, what his theories, his thinking to India and trying to, to look at the interaction of all these issues. And it's great, you know, as much as it's great to see that we move forward in a lot of things, it's also useful to see that the old ideas and the old thinking really still are there and run through a lot of what we're trying to achieve. Um, now we move on into questions from the floor. We have a few that have already come in that I think will probably keep us fairly occupied, but please do send any others through and we will get in as many as we can. The first one from Tara Nelson, who is at Sciences Po in Paris. Um, this is particularly directed to Mauro and uh, basically two parts to the question. The first one about the Mia Casa Mia Vida project in Brazil looking at the success of it in rural areas, but I guess the question is, is it fair to comment that the program has been less successful in urban areas because of the need to relocate away from city centers and uh, the, the failure to deal with the question of connectivity and transport links that some other speakers have mentioned. And then finally, uh, also a dimension of that on the, the relationship between favelas and informality and the scale of that informality and how we look at the interaction of that to housing solutions and whether we need to look more at regularization and alternative housing solutions rather than, than also just uh, replacement programs. Um, Mauro, over to you. Okay, thanks for the question, Tara. Um, you are completely right. Um, I'm going to answer the second part first in terms of tenure and in terms of owning the houses. Um, I, I, I did mention Mia Casa Mia Vida, this My House, My Life program here, which is specifically, uh, uh, it was designed and it targets housing provision. There's another sector within the Ministry of Regional Development, within the, which then, you know, the section is uh, part of the National uh, Housing Secretariat that deals only with uh, ownership of housing. So there's a whole, you know, other, you know, staff and, and other policies, you know, that only deals with that. Um, I understand and I agree with you, ministry agrees with you that it's not feasible to do the same thing as housing provision uh, by relocation of people, you know, in, in, in big urban centers. And you mentioned the favelas. Favelas uh, are very special, you know, slums are a very special uh, case. And as, as I said, Mia Casa Mia Vida is something else. It doesn't apply to favelas, of course, as, as you rightly uh, pointed. Uh, what happens in favelas is that this other sector that works with uh, uh, regularization of ownership of housing, of tenure, um, in addition to another program, which is called um, Growth Acceleration Program, which started in um, two governments you know, uh, ago, uh, five, seven, five to seven years ago. Um, it has a specific program for favelas. So it's called PAC, which is in Portuguese, the acronym for um, Accelerated Growth Program for Slums. And in this program, you can have uh, the building of roads, 
you can have uh, remodeling of the houses. I mean, there's a series of interventions that may take place in this initiative. So you, yes, you are right. Uh, yes, and, and there's you know, some stuff going on that addresses uh, these issues. The second question is, um, oh, and it just, uh, oh, it's still about favelas. I guess I, I, I kind of addressed both, but I just want to point to one more thing about slums and, and big cities. Yes, you're right, coverage of my house, my life program is not huge in big cities for obvious reasons. Um, availability of lands to be purchased by the government to build these new complexes, you know, uh, where this population will be relocated to. Um, but then within the favelas, what, had, what has been tried and did not work out was to remodel and refurbish uh, with people living there. Uh, and when one reason was the solution would be to, to verticalize, if you will, the favelas, to make it more vertical. But then uh, elevators were a problem. You know, people have to, uh, I mean, where would maintenance come from? So people don't want to have extra, you know, spending. They don't have, you know, disposable income to add any more, you know, bills to their already, you know, limited budget. So that was a problem. And I think that's, it's a very complex issue. But in, in, in summary, yes, there's a uh, policy in place for that. And I can direct you to the proper you know, websites or link you to the proper uh, uh, people if you need to. Okay. Thank you for that. Next up, I have a question from Mauro uh, that, that is more general, but I'm going to, in the interest of time, direct that to a couple of people. Um, the question is, how important is a centralized or federal initiative to make housing needs a priority in countries where states, provinces have a large degree of autonomy. I think this uh, is relevant in a number of countries where you're dealing with multi-level governance. Um, I would first like to ask if Ken Gibb could give us uh, an observation on that. Ken? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a, it's a classic pro problem, uh, which of course needn't be a problem, I suppose, but yes, uh, I can think of many, many systems in countries like Canada and Australia with essentially fed, federal si systems where uh, there's a, you, you can easily get a, a kind of conflict between dif di different levels. And what, what I mean by that is that our uh, ho housing policies and policies that affect housing clearly come from policies at different, different scales. And we shouldn't imagine that they're all joined up. So, uh, in in the case of the UK, we have a we have a, a largely UK level uh, benefit system, and that benefit system is really critical to how our housing system works at a local level. But our subsidies for social and affordable housing operate at the Scottish level, or the English level, or the Northern Ireland level, or the Welsh level, and they may, of course, come in, come into con con conflict. So it. it and, and I think you know there's there's there, there have been trends. I know in Canada over a period of time there was a a, de a devolution of responsibilities for housing down the way to more local levels, but funding controlled at the centre. And and you know clearly you get into you get into conflicts intergovernment intergovernmentally as a result. So I think it's a very big assumption to make that there's going to be a rational and just system of government in place which will take account of the system wide effects of housing vertically and horizontally at the same time. Uh, it would clearly be, uh, you know, I think in many cases it would be advantageous if there was more de facto de devolution of the of the significant funding powers to a more lo local level, obviously with checks and balances and constraints attached to it, but that doesn't often seem to be the case. Um, I would also like to ask if uh, Dr. Rajiv Mishra, if you would have any comments on that point. Please, you're on mute, Dr. Mishra, but please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in Indian context also, as you know, we, we are in the federal system. So the states play a major role in construction of houses. So in our program for housing for all, what has happened, a kind of flexibility is given to a state to decide upon their contribution of subsidy, but government of India gives a fixed subsidy. So roughly it comes out to be cost around one third or one half cost of the house, depending upon the area and a small city or big city. And roughly around same amount is given by the state governments. 
so actually it's a kind of mix of subsidy but government of india takes the lead because it sanctions the cost it it it, it develops a policy and it gives financial assistance to the states but there are several states who have given much more than government of india there are some states their subsidy is much less than what government of india is given but in this program that kind of flexibility is given and in some of the program the beneficiary contribution is also almost 50% so it's a mix but government of india certainly i mean the federal government certainly leads the way by providing a kind of subsidy and then encourages states to come up to meet this shortage of housing thank you very much for that I will now move on to our next question, which is from Lidi Ira Babarira. I apologize for my pronunciation. Um, this is uh, directed to Dr. Josephine and asks, how far has Rwanda, Rwanda progressed in the direction of sustainable neighborhoods? Have they started any implementation regarding that? Yeah, thank you, Robert and um, Lidi for the good question. Uh, so, um, yes, I would say yes. Uh, a few years ago, 10 years ago, um, the intervention seemed to be different and it was more of relocation, you know, moving people from, you know, these uh, informal settlements or unplanned neighborhoods, you know, to this uh, kind of modern housing. Uh, but as we speak, um, Lidi would know a place called um, Kimisagara. In this area, uh, there's already a project that was completed uh, two years ago, um, towards last year that now that seems to be shifting you know the focus seems to be shifting from relocating people you know to new housing that's at the peripheries or far away from the city to actually keeping them where they are and there's also uh, lots of uh, informal settlement upgrading projects uh, the pilot was done in a place called Agatare Lidi if you know the place just right next to the University of Rwanda uh, College of Science and Technology campus in Yarugenge and the World Bank is also just have to, you know, fund another four projects like that. So they, there is a shift and there are already examples. There are really very few, you know, looking at the market and the, you know, housing stock and uh, the expectation that we need 35,000 dwelling units per year, but they, they still remain, um, you know, a promising entry into the market. So the hope is that, you know, this uh, kind of thinking, the rehousing, you know, kind of thinking, you know, gains speed and momentum and, and maybe we could have, you know, many more units to talk about in the next future. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, the next question is from Stephanie Gerritsen, a colleague of mine at UN Habitat, um, who is asking if there are any recommendations on how to mainstream housing into national urban policies. Um, I would first like to ask Dr. Smarajit Jana if you have any thoughts on that what should we be reflecting in national policy? Have I got you there, Dr. Jana? I've got you on mute. Still on mute, I'm afraid. I need you to unmute your microphone. There Am we go. I audible now? I can hear you now, please go ahead. I think the uh, national policy should incorporate uh, this housing for all under this banner, the, I, I see a couple of programs and uh, Mr. Misra has also shared that uh, central government provide uh, major share. I think it is 60-40 for major states and 80-20 for North, in North Indians, uh, North East part of the country. Uh, but I think uh, keeping in view, uh, not only for COVID, but for good healthy means environment to create health environment, there should be clear cut uh, kind of, I think, uh, uh, annual or planned GDP, percentage of GDP, which should be contributed for housing, for the poorer section to begin with, that's one. Second, I think the policy should include how it could reach out to the marginals of the marginals, which I CR like LGBTQ, sex workers and others. Thirdly, of course, the issue of migrant workers came up and government has a plan and to, to create uh, housing for these uh, particularly interested migrants and all. But beyond that, our policy should incorporate many other elements uh, like in, a, in a emergency situations like COVID and others, how the policy and program stands by the sides of the people 
those who are unable to enjoy uh, i i think the basic housing facilities uh, it should be articulated in the program and it should be reflected in the budgeting also thank you, thank you for that um i would also like to offer the floor to professor katikiredi is there anything that you would like to to respond on that that you would like to see it incorporated into national policy Yeah, so I, I think that this point about um, uh, how we reach uh, those most disadvantaged in society is absolutely crucial. Uh, so I think um, within uh, high income countries, we've probably uh, not paid that enough focus. Um, so, for example, we know there are uh, uh, arguably interventions that could be implemented like housing first approaches uh, to deal with street homelessness, which um, are not really widely implemented, at least in countries like the UK, uh, and not at the scale that they should be. Um, and often, uh, I think those types of approaches are likely to yield benefits, not just from the the kind of housing point of view, but also from a health point of view. So um, the, the health inequalities we see amongst socially excluded populations are far, far greater than most other health inequalities um, which are monitored. Um, and that tends to be an area that's neglected within both national and international policy. Thank you very much for that. Um... The next question that I have is from Anna Miranda from the University of Glasgow, one of the organizers, who has a question for Ken Gibb. What are the main risks and challenges that have been produced by the emergency housing responses implemented in the UK? Well, that's a that's a uh, quite a multi-layered thing, I suppose. There's a lot of things potentially going on. I suppose, as you mentioned yourself earlier on, there's there's this whole question about the unwinding of the eviction suspensions and how that's actually played out in practice and whether that doesn't just you know as it were uh, create a new a new growth in, in homelessness and people in precarious housing sit situations i think the, uh, the 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 recession that's underlying what's happening now in the economy and, and the concerns which are being expressed rightly about really large increases in unemployment that's important because it's also going to have an, an incredibly unequal set of outcomes as well. I'm going to increase inequality in the sense that some work we've been doing recently about the uh, prospects for social housing tenants to increase their employment rates, for, for, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of really good work going on, but, but a lot of it depends on public funding. We know that public funding is going to be threatened in a lot of cases as we, as we move through the, the consequences of a huge public deficit that, that, that we now have. So I think we, a lot of people are concerned that the, the employment and hence the income potential of many uh, people who are already disadvantaged, who, who are, are in uh, uh, social housing, for instance, that that, that is probably going to get, get worse. And so finding ways to, to defend their weaker position will be very uh, important. So there are real challenges about whole homelessness and there's actually some quite interesting work just following on from what Vita was saying. Uh, there's some quite interesting work being done by philanthropic capital in London, for instance, about trying to put together projects which can find long-term so so solutions and housing so solutions for the very people who are taken off the streets earlier earlier in, in, in the year. And that's about bringing partnerships together who can purchase off the shelf housing as well as elements of new, 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 new built housing to find long-term so solutions. But actually, there's actually also evaluations going on just now of housing first in England and on quite a big scale. So I hope we'll get some good uh, solid evidence about how it works in, in, in England. And there are some pilots going on in Scotland as well. So that's hopefully going to be a bigger part of the of the solution it's only one solution of many in, in, in the future so I, I would go back I think more to uh, my, my earlier point about the extent to which uh, government recognizes that the, 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 the kind of behavioral and market changes that have been set up pace by by people people the way we're responding to, to, to COVID which is a quite different long-term challenge as opposed to the emergency response which as I said at the beginning is really quite incredible what, what was done it's in some some regards but it is only fit for that immediate kind of issue rather than the longer term 
Thank you for that. Uh, in the spirit of going out with a bang, um, we have a question from John Walls, an urban planner from Glasgow, who is noting that housing is critical for well-being and its construction is an important contributor to a country's GDP. Um, do the panelists see public sector-led social and affordable housing as part of the econ economic recovery process post-COVID? And in addition to public resources, can the panelists envisage governments trying to tap into private resources to deliver the necessary housing? Um, I am personally firmly of the point of view that there is no country in the world that will ever address housing without proper public money being involved. I just don't think, I've never seen a case where it's a possible solution without it. Um, but absolutely, one has to be able to look at how to work with the private sector and how to encourage and direct private sector effort wherever possible as well. Um, but my opinions in this are less important than those of the presenters. I would like to first offer the floor to Dr. Mauro Sanchez on that point. Uh, thanks for the question, John. I think you're absolutely right in terms of, uh, and Robert, uh, uh, without the public sector, you know, it's not feasible. Uh, in, th in terms of economic recovery after the pandemic, um, I'm going to use what I have already said when I talked about how the this My House, My Life program uh, was, uh, was planned and, and, and conceptualized right from the start. One of the purposes was to, you know, increase uh, the number of jobs, move the economy, because as I said, civil construction, you know, is a major factor uh, and, a, and, a, and a large proportion of the employed people uh, in Brazil. As unemployment grows during the pandemic, you know, one of the ways to address this, yes, is to encourage, you know, uh, construction to, um, to be, I mean, to regain its strength. And I think building public housing is a vocation uh, of, the, of the public uh, of public policy. Generally, you notice any change you contribute to fighting the COVID? Sorry. And so, so I think that's, uh, that's yes, one of the major issues. And in terms of the private sector, uh, it has already um, happened in Brazil. Uh, the private sector is part of, this, uh, of the public housing policy uh, via uh, public-private uh, partnership, PPP. Uh, so I think, yes, they should continue to play this role and just one last thing in terms of private participation, sometimes the level of participation from the private sector, in my opinion, depends on the political climate of the country. So right now we have a government that's, um, that's more prone to allowing private companies to, you know, to take part of public policy. And so sometimes you know, elections play a role in the level of engagement of the private sector. But I agree that uh, they are also a major player in this uh, in this uh, initiative. Thank you. And uh, next, I would like to offer the floor to Dr. Josephine Malonza. So, Josephine, this question of public-private sector balance and public policy. Over to you. Thanks, thanks, Robert. But maybe before I go directly into that, I also just wanted to mention something directly uh, related to you know the overall you know future outlook of, of the housing policy, is that the, the recognition has to be there that you know the, the context the contextualization or the conceptualization of housing itself has changed. Housing you know means much much more to us, especially after COVID nineteen, where our houses became not just a place to live and sleep, but also you know the schools for our children you know, the offices that we had to work from or we are still working from, uh, the healthcare facilities for those that are to, to need extra care or isolation or, or, or this and that. So those, you know, small uh, realizations that are coming, you know, in through COVID-19 can also be used to inject, you know, energies into, you know, how housing policy has to be formulated both at the international and at the national policy level. So again, I agree with the, the, the two, the two um, respondents, you know, that already, you know, pointed to the role of the private sector. I think governments are doing uh, a lot and, and, they, and they have big visions and dreams as far as adequate housing for their people is concerned. I think the only extra steps that need to be done is the realization that, you know, this pathway requires reinforcement, you know, from private sector, civil society, you know, from all these other different kinds of stakeholders in order to, 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 to ensure that there's con constant and concerted efforts, you know, towards uh, this action. So, I mean, as we let in the private sector, if there can be, you know, a better conceptualization of housing that I always insist needs to be context, you know, based. What does housing mean for Rwanda? Even when we are looking at our housing stock, 
you know, the, the gap that is there and how many units we have to produce and somebody else has to look at the context in Brazil and somebody else has to look at the context in India, what exactly is needed? And, and, and this, you know, makes, you know, finding the answer for the question that is already clear a little bit easier. The problem for me is that sometimes the questions that we ask, you know, might not be, you know, so clear and, and so contextual. So it ends up with, you know, typical, prototypical, you know, you know kind of solutions that, that don't always work for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And finally, I would like to, to offer the floor to Jana um, to ask if you have any comments on the, the question of public-private balance in the provision of housing. I've got you on mute still. We can't hear you, Dr. Jana. Sorry. So I think it is the primary responsibility of the public sector, which you actually pointed out. I fully agree with that. But there are scope for public-private partnership, particularly for middle income or higher income brackets, where they might be interested in. But keeping in view uh, this housing problem, particularly affecting uh, low income brackets, populations, marginalized groups and others, it is the public sector which should come forward, articulate its policies and support with appropriate budgetary allocations. Thank you very much for that. Um, in the agenda, I was meant to give my takeaway and uh, insights, but I think we're, one, we've run out of time and two, I think everybody has adequately covered it. I, I would like to, to more sort of put in a, a soundbite type comment, but in a lot of these discussions at the moment, the response to COVID from many governments has been to tell people stay at home. I think it's very critical and it's been highlighted by our discussions that if you can't eat or, or earn a living while at home, or if your home isn't safe, whether from a public health point of view or any other point of view, or if you don't even have a home, then you can't stay at home. And there is an obligation under human rights, the right to adequate housing, that the state should be endeavoring to protect and ensure that the existing rights of people are not eroded, and that as much as possible, the state advances the rights of people. Wherever possible, absolutely, work with the private sector, work with all actors to achieve that. But it is first and foremost a responsibility of a state towards its citizens. Um, with that, I would like to thank all of the panelists, the speakers, all of the people who asked questions and for everybody else who attended. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much to Gail and Anna for inviting me to, to chair this discussion. It's been a great pleasure. And I yield the floor to Anna for closing comments. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Robert, for chairing our event. And thank you very much for your questions. Uh, I think we had a lot of insights into housing policy and the many challenges that countries are facing right now. Um, I just want to ask you to post your comments and your feedback on Twitter and using the hashtag housing cities. Thank you very much for coming once again, and I hope to see you soon. Bye bye.